hopefully this is a good one. We'll what see. causes, say, heroin addiction? This is a really stupid question, right? It's obvious. We all know it. Heroin causes heroin addiction. Here's how it works. If you use... And just for... I, this is kind of a triggering uh, uh, site for me, but I am a uh, recovered heroin addict. Um, I think I'm at... What is it? About 12... 13 years clean now, something like that. After a while, I stopped counting, but um, so I was addict for about five years, went to prison, did uh, the craziest stuff. When you guys, lots of times you guys hear me tell some like insane stories about when I was younger and just the crazy stuff I would do. Most of it was because I, I was uh, a pretty hardcore drug addict for a long time. So <laughs> I, I used the needles, the syringes, the ties, all that stuff heroin for 20 days by day 21 your body would physically crave the drug ferociously because there are chemical hooks in the drug that's what addiction means but there's a catch almost everything we think we know about addiction is wrong if you for example break your hip you'll be taken to a hospital and you'll be given loads of diamorphine for weeks or even months Diamorphine is heroin. It's in fact much stronger heroin than any addict can get on the street because it's not contaminated by all the stuff drug dealers dilute it with. There are people near you being given loads of deluxe heroin in hospitals right now. So at least some of them should become addicts. But this has been closely studied. It doesn't happen. Your grandmother wasn't turned into a junkie by her hip replacement. Why is that? Our current theory of addiction comes in part from a series of experiments that were carried out earlier in the 20th century. The experiment is simple. You take a rat and put it in a cage with two water bottles. Ring on Twitch said, What the fudge? You only have 12 followers. You deserve more. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we're kind of new to Twitch. We're trying that platform out right now. Um, don't have a lot of content on there, but Hey, make sure you hit the share button. We are doing what we can to grow the community. So make sure you share it and hopefully we'll uh we'll we'll get some growth in on, on the Twitch platform. One is just water, the other is water laced with heroin or cocaine. Almost every time you run this experiment, the rat will become obsessed with the drugged water and keep coming back for more and more until it kills itself. But in the 1970s, Bruce Alexander, a professor of psychology, noticed something odd about this experiment. The rat is put in the cage all alone. It has nothing to do but take the drugs. What would happen, he wondered, if we tried this differently? So he built Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats. It's a lush cage where the rats would have colored balls, tunnels to scamper down, plenty of friends to play with, and they could have loads of sex. Everything a rat about town could want and they would have the drugged water and the normal water bottles. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, rats hardly ever use the drugged water. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. But maybe this is a quirk of rats, right? Well, helpfully, there was a human experiment along the same lines, the Vietnam War. 20% of American troops in Vietnam were using a lot of heroin. People back home were really panicked because they thought there would be hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States when the war was over. But a study followed the soldiers home and found something striking. They didn't go to rehab. They didn't even go into withdrawal. 95% of them just stopped after they got home. If you believe the old theory of addiction, that makes no sense. But if you believe Professor Alexander's theory, it makes perfect sense. Because if you're put into a horrific jungle in a foreign country where you don't want to be, and you could be forced to kill or die at any moment, doing heroin is a great way to spend your time. So th this is actually a common thing where people who take like pain medication for pain don't end up having an addiction problem, and they don't end up going through withdrawal. Somehow, their body just goes right back to normal. They can take it for years and never have any sort of addiction problem. I got hooked on pain medication because I got three surgeries in one. I was out of school when I was in eighth grade uh, for 
an entire year. I had all sorts of health problems. They couldn't figure out what was going on with me. And then eventually they found two cysts in my nasal cavities, the size of golf balls that were pumping poison into my bloodstream. So like think about like when people snort drugs up into their nasal cavity, it soaks into the bloodstream really quickly. And cysts always kind of pump poison, but they're not normally going to get into your bloodstream very easily. Whereas when it's in your nasal cavity, it gets into your bloodstream very easily. And so when I had two cysts, both the size of golf balls in my nasal cavities, they were pumping all sorts of poison into my bloodstream, poisoning my heart, giving me all sorts of problems where I slept about 20 hours a day, didn't really eat much, didn't, uh, you know, I was always kind of lagging and, and slow and had trouble, uh, just always felt sick, always felt like I was sick somehow. And, um, and they couldn't figure out what it was for almost an entire year until they found the cysts and, uh, I was back to school and back playing basketball and football. But when I got the surgery, my tonsils and my adenoids were so poisoned that they had to take those out as well. So they had, I think it was four procedures in one. They take one cyst out, they take the other cyst out, they take my tonsils out, they take my adenoids out. When I get done, they prescribe me liquid Demerol and liquid morphine. And when I got home, I didn't really want to take the liquid morphine or the Demerol. I didn't like it. it. It made me feel so like out of it and slow and just kind of, um, I, I wasn't able to think clearly. And so I didn't take the morphine. I didn't take the Demerol. Once I started to feel a little bit better though, cause I always, I, I already felt so crappy. I just got surgery done. I'm coming off of anesthesia. Like I, I just, I, I, I was so, I was in so much pain that it felt even worse to add some sort of like high to the way I felt to make me feel weird. And, and like, just a uh, like, I, I wasn't willing to add that on top of all of the other ways I was already feeling. I didn't like it. So I didn't take them. About 15 years old at the time. But then once I started feeling better, I'm like, ah, you know what? Like it still hurts. Let me try this stuff. Let me see how it feels. I didn't know I was getting high. I just knew that like it, it made me feel better. Then once I wasn't in pain anymore, I continued to drink the liquid Demerol and liquid morphine. Once I ran out of it, I called the doctor, said I was still in pain, and I needed more, and they prescribed me more. And once I finished that, I called the doctor, said I needed more. They wouldn't give me more. They didn't want to give me more morphine or Demerol. They said, no, you, you should have been done with this a long time ago. Um, we're we're going to have to bring you back in for more uh, for another visit, if you're going to get more, I knew there was nothing wrong with me, so I didn't go back in, but I did find other sorts of painkillers out on the streets that I was able to take instead that were able to supplement the morphine and the Demerol for me. And so I took that and I took that for years, uh, things like Percocet and hydrocodone over time. Those started to wear off. They didn't work that well. Um, I did, again, I didn't know I was addicted to anything. I just knew that I, I liked taking it. And so I did. Then I started moving up to harder things like Oxycontin. And I would start snorting the Oxycontin because that, that made it work faster. I got it quicker. Um, it, it was a better... It, it it was more intense. I, I could do less of it at a time and still get a, a more intense high from it. But over time, again, it all starts to wear off. I would take something uh, that you have like 10s, 20s, 
uh, 50s and 100s. They eventually stopped making the 100s, and I only had the, the 50s. And then uh, the 30s were really good as well because they didn't have a time cap on them, and so you were able to crush them up really easily and snort those. Those were uh, uh, Roxas sets. Um, and so over time, I start I keep moving up to higher and higher things until eventually somebody's like, hey, you could just do heroin. You'll get a lot less. It's a lot less expensive. Because um, like a, a one, I, I want to say 130 was about $30. A 50 was $50. Like they were all very expensive. And when you're taking like four or five of them a day, it's insanely expensive. So I had to start selling them just to support my own habit. And I dropped out of school and um, just kind of focused on selling drugs for the most part. But then I, I was told I could do heroin. And I thought, heroin? I Like, that's like for freaking drug addicts, dude. I'm not doing heroin. They're like, yeah, you're already doing heroin. You're doing Oxycontin. That's the same exact thing as heroin. Like, no, no. This is like, this is prescription medication. Okay, like doctors give this to people. This isn't, I'm not doing anything wrong here. They're like, no, you are. You are. You're not prescribed this medication. You're still taking it anyways. You're, you're, you're an addict. Like an addict? This is pain medication. What are you talking about? I can't be an addict. This is when like the painkiller pandemic or epidemic started. This is when it all started. I was, I was in like the the front of the train when it came to the painkiller epidemic um and so eventually i did i moved on to heroin drive down to atlanta all the time get heroin uh bring it back get needles shoot it up um my girlfriends my friends they all started doing it as well um before that like we all smoked weed and simple things like that but now we were all doing heroin. Some of my friends died from this. Uh, but eventually I, I started robbing houses because I couldn't support my habit anymore. I needed more and more and more over time. So I start robbing houses. I lived in a really rich neighborhood growing up. And I would rob really rich houses. I would take their jewelry. Uh, mostly just their jewelry. That's all I ever wanted because nobody looks at their jewelry box every single day. Normally you have a couple of you know, watches and rings and, and stuff like that sitting on your dresser that you wear on a consistent basis, but everything in the jewelry box is just what you've collected over time. So I went into the jewelry boxes and I took the gold, I took the diamonds, I took all of the expensive stuff, and then I went to some sort of pawn shop or something and, and sold it all off and would walk off with hundreds of dollars for uh, about 20 minutes of work. And I got really good at breaking into houses and learning how to like, you know, get through doors, get through windows, get, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, but eventually I, I got arrested. Um, my girlfriend, I had started stealing debit cards and I would go to like grocery stores. And when women would bend over to like pick stuff up, I would just walk over, grab a handful of whatever in their purse that's sitting in the buggy and just put it in my pocket and keep walking. And sometimes I would get debit cards and stuff. Sometimes I would get like mints and, and tampons and crap. I, you know, whatever. But eventually uh, we, we would go to ATMs and we were able to, um, it's a much more complicated story, but we were able to figure out pin numbers for debit cards. And so I gave one to my girlfriend and I told her not to use it. Just hold on to it for me. She took it. She went. She uh, withdrew money from a bank. Um, normally, if I went to an ATM to withdraw money, I wore a mask. I wore, you know, I made sure that I wasn't uh, able to be seen. I didn't drive my car there. Uh, but she did. She drove her car. She used the debit card. Detectives show up to my house. They say they've been investigating me for selling drugs for a long time. They know that I've been stealing stuff from people and robbing houses and all sorts of crap. But I, I'm like, nah, like you're, you, you have no proof. You can't get me. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So they said, okay, cool. Uh, by the way, 
your girlfriend just used an ATM and stole some money uh, from somebody else's debit card. So we're about to go arrest her. And I was like, am I, am I in trouble for her robbing the ATM? They're like, no, you're not. You're in trouble for a bunch of other stuff. But if you confess, we'll let her go. So, okay. All right. I did it. And they like they knew that my friends were robbing houses, all sorts of stuff. It wasn't just my girlfriend, but my girlfriend was kind of the breaking point where I was like, okay, I will go to jail. Everybody else gets to be free. I go to jail. Everybody skips town. They all disappear. We had all been selling drugs and doing all sorts of stuff. We had our own thing going on. Um, but when I got locked up, that was signs to everybody to just disappear. Um, and I was locked up for about 13 months, uh, over 13 months. I, I went to state facilities. Uh, I, you guys have heard lots of stories about me being locked up. Me being locked up, I, I got out after six months, went right back to doing drugs. I was out for two weeks, then went back for 13 months. Um, and when I went back for 13 months, that was it. I got out. I stayed clean. I never did drugs again. I, I and uh, I guess I that was a. I, I went much more into detail than I guess I, I had planned on. But the point in what I'm saying is, people who use drugs for what they're supposed to be used for don't seem to have the same problems as people who use them just for recreation, just to get high. So people who are in Vietnam who are trying to cope with all of the problems that they have um, in, in trying to um, – trying to probably self-medicate for depression and all sorts of things like that. They probably used heroin as an actual medication to help them through. And when they got back to America, they just didn't need it anymore. They were back with their family. They're back with their loved ones. They're sleeping under a roof in a bed. They just didn't need it. And they were able to go on without having any withdrawals or anything. This is common with people who use these drugs for things that are actually necessary outside of just getting high. It, it's a fairly common story. Um, Urusama on YouTube said, I always avoided painkillers with surgeries and stuff. I've only ever had alcohol, weed, and mushrooms. True. Project Sad Face said, I used to go... Uh, to AA once or twice a week after getting out of group homes. I still go to AA every now and then. We, we got a lot of addicts in here. All right. Uh, Melanie Henry on Facebook said, Rat Park explains why programs like Celebrate Recovery work so well. Project Sad Face said, I'll be back when voter fraud starts. Okay. All right. Uh, Ring on Twitch said, are you still in a relationship with your girlfriend at the time? No, I am not. Um, that girl, I was, uh, uh, she would come see me in jail all the time. And I would tell her like, hey, I'm probably going to be going away for a long time. Like you, you shouldn't come see me anymore. She's like, no, I, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. Like, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll still be here. Then when I got out for two weeks and then went right back, she came and saw me again. And I said the same thing. I'm like, hey, I'm going away for much longer this time. You, you, need, to, you need to quit coming to see me. She's like, no, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. Like, I, I, you, you're, you did this for us. So I, I'm not going to disappear on you. And I never saw her again. So that was that. Oh, I guess I did see her again. She showed up when I got out, but she showed up to my house super high. And I I was motivated to stay clean. So I made sure to stay away from her. And uh, 
you know, hoped that maybe she would get clean one day and we could be together, but that didn't work out that way. So, uh, Urusama on YouTube said, Hey, if you didn't get locked up, you'd have never discovered the big boy. That's true. That's true, dude. The big boy. It, 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 ha have any of you tried it yet? Have any of you watched the video and tried it? I know, uh, I know Tim Cheetah from, um, from the theologians table did his video on it. It's, it's good stuff. It is good stuff. I'm telling you. Uh, he said, uh, Urusama said, yeah, I think the brain's reason for taking them has a large amount to do with addiction. Even weed got pretty addicting when I was using it for the wrong reasons. I'm aware it's not, on the same level as harder drugs, though. Yeah, well, the, the surprising thing to me about this is that I, I, with heroin, with alcohol, with things like that, you actually have a physical addiction to where it starts to integrate itself into your body's chemistry and to where your body needs that drug to process normally. And when you stop taking that drug, that's why you go through withdrawals is because your body has gotten used to that being part of your chemistry. And when it's gone, all of a sudden your body's not normal anymore. It needs it. It's looking for it and it's not finding it. And so it goes and starts searching for other things to replace it in your body. And that's how you end up feeling so crappy is it's sucking just all of the vitamins and all of the nutrients out of every inch of your body. And you just can't like you just feel so horrible for a couple of days or a couple of weeks because your body is going through a true physical withdrawal. Uh, Melanie on Facebook said nobody wakes up one day with the intent to become an addict. Uh, Ring on Twitch said, hi, wondering is your name or something I can call you? I, I am Tom. So the name of the show is Tom Foolery. Uh, if you'll look at the, the logo right over, I can't point right over there. Uh, uh, the, the name of the show is Tom Foolery. So you can call me Tom. I am Tom of Tom Foolery. Uh, Urusama said, I haven't tried it yet, but I plan to. Oh, heroin? Yeah, dude. It's good. You'll enjoy it. Oh, you're talking about the big boy. Yes, the big boy. Will, yes, the big boy's good too. It's not as good as heroin, but it, you'll, you'll enjoy it. It's pretty good. Uh, Melanie Henry said it messes with your neuroceptors. It messes with a lot of things, but yes, your neuroceptors are the same. Uh, Melody Miles said, what's the name? What's the name of what? I'm not sure what you're asking. What's the name? Uh, what's the name of what? Appreciate Melody Miles on Facebook joining us today. All right, let's get back to the video. But if you go back to your nice home with your friends and your family, it's the equivalent of being taken out of that first cage and put into a human rat park. It's not the chemicals, it's your cage. We need to think about addiction differently. Human beings have an innate need to bond and connect. When we are happy and healthy, we will bond with the people around us. But when we can't, because we're traumatized, isolated or beaten down by life, we will bond with something that gives us some sense of relief. It might be endlessly checking a smartphone, it might be pornography, video games, Reddit, gambling, or it might be cocaine. But we will bond with something because that is our human nature. The path out of unhealthy bonds is to form healthy bonds, to be connected to people you want to be present with. Addiction is just one symptom of the crisis of disconnection that's happening all around us. We all feel it. Since the 1950s, the average number of close friends an American has has been steadily declining. At the same time, the amount of floor space in their homes has been steadily increasing. 
to choose floor space over friends, to choose stuff over connection. The war on drugs we've been fighting for almost a century now has made everything worse. Instead of helping people heal and getting their life together, we have cast them out from society. We so uh, Project Sad Face said, LMAO, hold the phone. Urusama, weed is an addictive, bro, stop it. Okay, so there's a couple of types of addictions. So what I was talking about earlier where you have withdrawals and things like that, there's only a couple of things that can actually give your body physical withdrawals or a couple types of drugs. Alcohol, heroin, and uh, barbiturates, uh, things like Xanax and um, Klonopin, things like that. Uh, lots of antidepressants, uh, those sorts of things can give you physical withdrawals and physical addictions a mental addiction though can be can, can be formed around almost anything so you can form a mental addiction around weed especially things that make your body feel good um your brain can get used to feeling good and then need that to to feel normal your brain can start to find its own coping mechanisms when it comes to having a high um, and releasing endorphins and things like that um, or releasing dopamine into your body. Your, your brain can start to form its own mental addictions around just about anything, and weed is one of those things. I've known lots of people who have actually gone to rehab for marijuana because – they truly have mental addictions to it. A mental addiction is not the same as a physical addiction. It's not nearly as bad. I, I don't want to downplay it, but it's not. It's just not the same. Urusama said it was a psychological thing, not talking about physical withdrawal. Yeah. Uh, Project Sadface on YouTube said, although it checks out, sounds like something you would say. You think Trump won the election, LMAO. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a jerk. <laughs> All right. We have made it harder for them to get jobs and become stable. We take benefits and support away from them if we catch them with drugs. We throw them in prison cells, which are literally cages. We put people who are not well in a situation that makes them feel worse and hate them for not recovering. For too long, we've talked only about individual recovery from addiction. But we need now to talk about social recovery because something has gone wrong with us as a group. We have to build a society that looks a lot more like Rat Park and a lot less like those isolated cages. This sounds a lot like Marxism or some sort of like socialist or communist ideas where they say like, hey, we need more time for the things we like. And we need to just be happy. That's what's important. Let's just do the things that make us feel happy. Stop working so much. If we want to do drugs, if we want to have sex all day, if we want to, uh, if we want to party all day, like that, those are the things that we need to get used to. Those are the things that we need to do more, and we need to build society around what makes us happy. As we discussed earlier with the first video, I, I, I it, rats don't completely like, like their psychology doesn't completely apply to humans but there's a large conversation around whether or not people without any sort of motivations or any sort of duties can still have drive in life and meaning in life without responsibility so it i don't know but I, I've talked about this numerous times where I've said to people, if heroin addicts didn't have such a problem coping within society, if they didn't go out robbing people, if they were able to show up to work every day, if they didn't OD and die, like heroin wouldn't be such a problem. They could get high all the time. Nobody would really care. No, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Which is why they've come out with drugs like methadone or Suboxone, where they can give these to addicts 
where it tricks their brain into believing that they're high without actually getting them high. And they can cope like that throughout life. Then they're able to go to work and they're able to, they don't have to worry about overdosing. They like it, it is, uh, it, it, it pretty much is somebody who seems to be high all the time without any of the bad side effects, without any of the bad things that come with addiction. They still have a physical addiction to it, so if they ever have to get off of it, it's, it's definitely a big problem. But those people exist in this world. Those people are, are all over the place, going to work every day, just like normal people, and they feel as though they're high, and you have absolutely no clue. So, um, Melanie Henry on Facebook said, the opposite of addiction is relationships slash companionship. Maybe. I mean, I think you could be addicted to sex. So, uh, Urasama said, once I stopped, it actually ended up easier to deal with my problems sober, though. It was a big old illusion, which is an interesting lesson. Yep. He also said, I'm, I'm just not making any calls on the election till it's over. I think could flip for sure. We, we will get to the election stuff in just a minute. We're almost done with this video. We are going to have to change the unnatural way we live and rediscover each other. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. This video is a collaboration. That's what Melanie just said. The opposite of addiction is companionship. Okay. Uh, Ring on Twitch said, People who take drugs are pushed away from society. Unfortunately, possible making addiction worse because of it not being a, a social norm. And the reason for... The reason for put addicts in jail is because prison is meant to be a social rehab and putting them back in the social norm. I think that's what you were trying to say. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's possible. Like I said, I, I was forced to be clean. I didn't have much of a choice. And therefore, I got clean and, and was able to stay clean. Um, but I don't know that like punishment is necessarily the right idea when it comes to treating addicts. Um, I think that there's much better ways to do things and, and governments are experimenting right now with things like drug court and, um, NA classes or, or mandated classes, things like that. Hopefully we can incentivize them to get clean but it is true that, that we could possibly get to a point where people are allowed to use drugs and abuse drugs without it being a problem without it being something that we have to look down on um melanie henry said you can abuse methadone and suboxone you can also od if mixed with the wrong medication actually one of my best friends died from using methadone and klonopin. He was prescribed both at the same time. And he died. Uh, big Rich. R.I.P. All right. Melanie Henry said jail slash prison is not a rehab by any means. I mean, it was for me. I Especially once I got there, uh, they had NA classes. They had AA classes. They know that lots of people are in there because they are addicts and it, it, the addiction makes them commit crimes and do stupid things. It, it's a good way to force you to be away from drugs, especially – lot. Like, rehab doesn't work for a lot of people, especially all the heroin addicts that I know. Rehab never worked for them. You know why? Because you don't have to stay. 
at any point, you can just get up and walk out of that place and go get some drugs if you want to. You don't have that option in prison. You can't just get up and go get drugs. Sometimes prison is not only a good form of rehab, sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes it's the best form of rehab. All right, all right, all right, all right. Here we go. Voting fraud. 